This morning's lesson from the Gospel of Luke doubles back to a time shortly before the lesson a week ago and tells us about one of Jesus' first acts of public ministry. Soon after his baptism by John and long wilderness fast, Jesus returns home to Galilee. Reports about him spread far and wide, undoubtedly the result of his miracles and teaching in villages and towns. When he reaches Nazareth, his childhood home, it's a big day in the village synagogue. Everyone turns out, eager to hear their native son who left years before, made a name for himself and his home with family and friends for a few days. According to Luke, Jesus enters the synagogue on the first Sabbath after his arrival. The place would have looked a little smaller to him than when he was growing up there, but otherwise, little had changed. Mary and Joseph prepared Jesus for life, carefully raising him in the Jewish faith. Jesus was regular in his attendance at Sabbath school and Parents brought him weekly as a baby child and a teenager. He wasn't always easy to bring, especially when he was little. Mary and Joseph are patron saints for parents throughout the ages who bring their babies and toddlers and children and teens to church, who make sure that they get to Sunday school and receive confirmation training and are received as full and responsible members of the body of Christ. While not always easy, parents in the first century and parents today know that children who participate fully in the community of faith are more likely to maintain a firm foundation when later they face the crises of life. So Jesus returns to the synagogue of his childhood thankful for the training and the nurture received there. As worship begins, Jesus is invited to read the lesson from the ancient prophets. There's no lectionary to consult as to the reading. The choice is up to him. Nor is there a book to look through. Instead, a rather large scroll is placed on the lectern before him. Jesus, searching for a familiar text, unrolls it to a place near the end of the scroll. And in a strong and mature voice, he reads these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When he finishes reading, Jesus rolls the scroll, hands it back to the attendant, and sits down. Now, since it was customary for teachers or rabbis to sit rather than to stand, as Jesus takes his seat, the eyes of everyone in the room focus on him expecting some commentary on the lesson just read, a lesson well known to everyone present that day. Now the presiding officer of the synagogue can invite anyone to present a comment on the text. Often villagers would speak, but not on this day. The people wait for Jesus, their hometown boy, One can imagine Jesus gazing on the familiar faces from earlier years, perhaps appearing a little older now. His childhood friends present with their own children, the parents of his friends, now senior citizens, as he begins with words that remain fresh and electrifying even today. Jesus liberates the passage he's just read. 
He lets the lion out of the cage, so to speak. He overthrows the ho-hum expectations of the people around him by declaring to those gathered, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In saying this, Jesus does the unexpected, the unimaginable, on that notable day in Nazareth. In the religious language of today, Jesus claims for himself the ancient prophetic words from Isaiah as his own mission statement. The reason that God's Spirit comes to rest on him at the time of his baptism, as we learned a couple of weeks ago, was to empower him to do precisely what he was doing on this day bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, letting the oppressed go free, and proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, the jubilee year, when the economy would conform anew to God's justice. Jesus takes the entire passage from Isaiah's book as his mission statement, not content to leave it just a string of high-sounding words. All that follows in Jesus' life, as presented to us in the Gospels, amounts to the careful living out of the ancient prophecy he claims for himself that morning in Nazareth. In fact, Jesus continues his mission and ministry until his enemies finally kill him for doing so. Many welcomed what Jesus was doing. Others did not because it upset their unfair advantage. It questioned their complacency and pushed them to recognize that They're not taking the words of Jesus about ministry to the needs of others as seriously as they should. They find their increasing discomfort intolerable and think that his judicious death would bring an end to the matter. They were wrong. Jesus rises from death and continues even today to do what he spoke about on that Sabbath morning in Nazareth. Today, however, Jesus works through his mystical body, the church, through each of us and all who are part of his body. Jesus strives to live out his mission statement, bringing good news to those who need it setting free those chained in captivity, opening the eyes of the blind, helping the oppressed and exploited to find new life, and unrolling the floor plan that sets in motion God's reign where justice and peace will one day prevail. The Apostle Paul, in the lesson from 1 Corinthians that Kevin read to us, outlines clearly how the mission and ministry of the church remain the mission and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ first shared in the synagogue in Nazareth. The apostle makes several references to the body of Christ in his letters. His image implies unity but also diversity. Like birds of a feather, we tend to associate with those who are similar to us. And yet the church encourages and sometimes even forces us to be in fellowship with all sorts of people. It takes all kinds of people to make the world what it is and to make the church what it is. Perhaps this accounts for Paul's listing the body parts in his lesson, foot, hand, ear, eye, nose, head, and all the rest. All are necessary. All are part of the whole structure that makes up the body. 
in a similar manner, we need all kinds of people to make up the body of Christ, the church. Each of us, each of us has unique spiritual gifts to share. What we have in common is the source of our gifts. God provides us with the gifts we share with one another. They may be very different gifts, but can still be used in meeting the needs of others. An old legend has a squirrel telling a mountain, I may not be able to carry forests on my back, but neither can you crack a nut. The Trappist monk, theologian, writer, and teacher Thomas Merton once said, for each of us, there's only one thing necessary to fulfill our destiny according to the will of God, to be what God wants us to be. God never asks why we aren't like someone else. God's only question to us is, Why aren't we more fully who we are? The result of comparison is often competition. And while competition with one another may be a good thing in the Olympics, it's seldom a good thing in the body of Christ. Henry Van Dyke once said, Use whatever talents you possess. The woods would be very silent if no birds sang except those who sang best. The body of Christ, the church, this church, thrives because of the positive efforts of each of its members. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying to the Corinthians and to each one of us here this morning. This is what God is calling us to do when he invites us to make our part of the world a better place in which to live. The story is told of how in a small country church, a portrait of Jesus as the good shepherd was being painted on the wall behind the altar. Only an outline of the shepherd's head and shoulders was visible. A visitor to the church noticed the the vague outline and asked one of the members when the painting would be finished. Startled by the question, the church member said the painting is finished. Well, the visitor pressed him saying that most of the painting was missing, the eyes, the mouth, the arms, the hands, the legs. In fact, he said the whole body of the Lord was missing. The member said, you'll never see that on a wall. The body of Christ is the congregation that gathers here to worship. What do Paul's words mean for us today? They mean just as the word of God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, we are to embody the work of God as the body of Christ, the church. The spirit of Jesus Christ lives today in the gathered community of his disciples, the church, this church. One of the mystics of ancient times wrote this, Christ has no body on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which to look with Christ's compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which to go about doing good work, and yours are the hands with which Jesus is able to, to bless others. Where do you find yourselves in today's lesson from Luke? 
Are you reading the scriptures like Jesus? Are you one of the listeners? Are you one of those protesting, well, we don't want change in any fashion? Or are you one of those saying, I want to be one of his disciples. I want what Jesus has. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I want to be more like Jesus. The story is told how, quite by accident, a young man wandered unknowingly into a Quaker meeting house. To his great surprise, no one was saying anything. It was absolutely quiet. Everyone was sitting, just listening, in complete silence. The young man sat there for a while, but didn't have a clue about what was happening. Finally, he gathered up his courage and nudged the fellow sitting next to him and said, pardon me, but when does the service begin? The man smiled sweetly and softly replied, when we leave here, The service begins when we leave here. And so it was, and so it is, and so shall it ever be. Amen.